you have to get connected to that fly. Then once you're connected physically to the fly, hopefully you're still visually connected to the fish. Now you can start your secondary presentation, which is actually when you're going to present the fly to the fish. That's going to be changing with the light angle. We got to make sure the fish can see the fly at the farthest distance away from the fish. That was Bruce Char describing how to present the fly properly for giant tarpon. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, episode 124. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I talked to Bruce Chard, who is one of the great uh, saltwater fly anglers for the big three out of the Florida area. Today, we hear some great tips on how you could find giant tarpon, what pre-spawn tarpon look like, and how weather affects them, and how to get hooked on a seven-second ride. Don't miss this one as Bruce gives us some killer wind ta- uh, casting tips and provides a new test for your leader breaking strength. We barely skimmed the surface in this one, but went super deep, if that's possible. So, without further ado, here is Bruce Chard. How's it going, Bruce? Great, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, we were just kind of, <laughs> we were just off air chatting a little bit about where we met. And, uh, you know, I've met a bunch of people at IFTD this year, and we've talked about that on the podcast. So it was fun kind of quickly meeting you in person. But today we're going to jump into a lot of tarpon fishing in Florida, which is, you know, where you're out and you, your name's kind of all over the place out there. Maybe before we jump deep into tarpon, can you just talk about how you first got into fly fishing? Sure. Um, I was uh, 18 years old and I lived in Venice, Florida. And, uh, I, there's nothing more I want to do than try to go fly fishing in salt. So I did. And I went and got my first, uh, Fluger medalist reel and, and Cortland XP fly rod from the local fly shop and, uh, had a great fly casting lesson. I bought three flies for $12 and then lost them all the very first night. And I said, Oh, I better get into tying or else I'm going to go broke quick. Little did I know I'm probably going to go broke more from buying all the material. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I got into tying and then that just fed my addiction for everything. And then literally within six months, I probably didn't go one minute of the day practically without casting and fishing and doing everything I could. I was just totally obsessed and passionate. And I, uh, I said, I want to be a guide and this is what I'm going to do. And I thought, you know, the best place to do this would be in the Florida Keys. So I literally threw everything I owned in a little U-Haul and drove down there and rented a little apartment and, uh, Got a job at a local fly shop down in Marathon, Florida, at the Ferro Blanco Outfitters in Marathon, and uh, started working there. And from there, I got to uh, run trips on my days off uh, from the shop there. And I also ran the shop as well. And I got to meet all the reps in the industry that came through. And then I started going to the shows and, and meeting people in the uh, in the industry at the shows. And that just fueled my whole business. And literally the first year I started guiding, I was book solid hmm. and, and I've been very fortunate ever since to be able to continue uh, staying busy and doing as much work as I can in the industry and traveling as much as I can and experiencing the great world of saltwater fly fishing. Wow. That is cool. Yeah. You pretty much been all in and what year was when you were 18, what, what year was that? 92, 1992. Oh yeah. 92. Yep. Yeah. So, and <laughs> And Venice, so, I mean, there are, I guess there is some trout fishing in, in California, obviously, but so saltwater, just you were there and I mean, you just, there was never any thought about trying uh, trout and stuff, I guess, right? You just jumped right into salt. Yeah. So, uh, believe it or not, and I apologize, I didn't mention this, but, uh, I'm actually from Venice, Florida. Oh, my bad. Venice, California. No, no. Yeah, my mind's on California. On the West coast of Florida, a little South of Sarasota, a little North of Boca Grande. So we had, uh, exceptional snook fishing um matter of fact um back when in 1992 and 93 time frame there were numerous articles written in the fly fishing magazines about an area in venice called snook alley Hmm. and it was a great nighttime snook fishing uh section of the intercoastal waterway there where a lot of the people that owned docks there had uh big night lights that they hung over the dock and Uh all the shrimp bait fish would hang out under the lights and then that would bring in all the schools of snook so I, uh, I really slept, uh, at night <laughs> and huh. did a lot of nighttime fishing for snook. It was really, really fun. 
Wow. And uh, I still go up there and do that. My my parents still live in Venice, and they still go up there and visit and check it out. It's it's a lot of fun. Cool. cool. So that's still uh, uh, the night uh, shining the light and, and casting with flies is still a pretty common practice out there. Yeah, the light the lights are mounted on the docks and the, of the uh, houses that, oh, that right. live there. Gotcha. Yeah. So when the tide when the tide goes in uh, and and moves one direction, all the bait and everything are on one side of the light, and then they all switch when the tide switches, and and then the Snook lay inside the light down low and outside in the edges. And of course they ambush anything that comes through the light. So they're, uh, they're looking for food and they're feeding. So it's kind of fun. Yeah. If you can cast up underneath the dock of, uh, a little bit and pull your fly through there. A lot of times you'll get a strike right away. That's amazing. It's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you've been guiding this. It's cool. And obviously I've had a bunch of guides on here over the you know last couple of years and, uh, you know, it's, it's challenging. I've done a little bit of guiding and it's uh, not an easy thing to do. It, it sounds like something you, you were just made for. Is there a reason why you think, you know, you kind of, and you still guide, is that your full, mainly your main income? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, still guide about 280 days a year. Wow. I stay pretty busy and the, um, uh, your, sorry, what was your question? Yeah, yeah. So my question was, is, uh, you know, it sounds like you were kind of, cut out for it. I mean, what, what makes, you know, I'm kind of thinking of, I was just talking to, uh, let's see, Justin, he's at, um, at CB fly fishing on Instagram. And I, I was kind of wanted to give him a shout out, but we've been chatting there. He's, he's kind of, I think kind of new to it. And he was curious about, he, he's tying some flies and trying to make it, you know, trying to make a thing. Do you have any tips for him? Somebody new out there that wants to be a guide to, to help them maybe learn more about it, get into it? Uh, go to the IFTD show. Oh, really? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, uh, out of sight, out of mind. So if you get to know people in the industry, um, so if, 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 if nobody knew who Bruce Chard was and somebody asked you right now, I'm going to the Florida Keys and I'm going to go fishing, who, who do I call? Right. Well, if you didn't, you don't know who I am, you've never met me, you never heard of me, you never nothing, how would you know to even recommend me? Exactly. So even though I might be there and I might be, you know, a great guide, there's if the if nobody knows who you are. So if the IFTD show is is great for meeting people and people in both in the that own fly shops and fly clubs and anything to do with the whole industry, it's 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 huge. So meeting people and and networking with people is is what it's all about. But on the other hand, what what I think helped me the most is something that actually probably doesn't really have anything to do with fly fishing. And that is I've, I've learned over the years to uh, get along with all kinds of different types of personalities mm-hmm. and uh, almost to a fault where sometimes I, I was naive and didn't realize that, that maybe um, it's not as fun to fish with this type of an, uh, personality than it is with a different kind. And, um, I learned that the hard way over the years and now I'm a little more sensitive to it, but for, for a long time, I just, I could roll with whatever type of personality that were on the boat, mm-hmm. make a good day of it and make it work, which I think I'm learning from a lot of other people that that's a challenge. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think as you become, you know, you do it for years and years, you find your, your clients that you really love and they become kind of like your friends and you see them kind of year after year, right? Yeah, that's where it really comes in keys. You you create a relationship with your angler or your client and you become more so of a friend than anything else. And then then you really enjoy being on the boat all day long with them. <laughs> and and then you don't mind going out to dinner with them when you're done. And all that is just a great part of the trip for them and yeah. for you to spend time with them. And you look forward to your customers when they come instead of um you get fish one angler for more than, you know, two or three days, usually five or six days a piece. So you're not switching out rods and re-rigging rods and reels every day for yeah. a new client and not having to go through the whole spiel of, of teaching everybody every single day, every aspect over and over again. At least you can have a base to work with and you continue to build on that base every day you fish. And then on top of that, that flows into the the next time they come and the next season or, or maybe even the next month when they come back. So it's, it's a really, yeah. it's, it definitely makes a difference. No, it's cool. Uh, well, we're going to jump into tarpon here. I, before we get fully in there, I was just kind of thinking we mentioned IFTD and it used to be, I just actually went to my first show this last year, but before that, what it was out in your neck of the woods, right? Uh, I think the last three, four years it's been in Orlando. Oh, Orlando. Right. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's about six hours north of where I am in the Florida Keys, but yeah, still pretty close. So pretty close, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and was that a big? I mean, the chain. It sounds like Denver is obviously a hot spot for trout fishing, but did that affect you know you much? As far as does it really matter to you whether it's in Orlando or Florida, or is it kind of the same deal? Or sorry, well, whether it's in Orlando or, or Denver. <clears throat> well, when it was in Orlando, we were um, inside the ICAST show. So we were working with the regular fishing industry as well That's and right. uniting both of our uh, trade industry shows together. So that was a diff- just something different that I think everybody in the fly fishing industry has never seen or been a part of before. So that was really cool to experience that. But when it really comes down to the roots of, of all fly fishing, there's no better place or no city better than Denver. Yeah. There's more, more fly fishermen per square mile <laughs> in that area than anywhere else. And it's, there's more fly shops. There's more everything right there. Yeah. So it is a great hub to have the show. And it showed this year proved to be the case where the shows sold out and with great attendance from the dealers and from the manufacturers, it was just a great all around show. The vibe was great. And everybody is, uh, I think a lot of almost everybody's rebooked again for next year already. It's it's going to be another fun year next year for sure. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yeah. And I, I had a great time, definitely made some connections and I, uh, I just interviewed recently. Uh, it's kind of a random interview, but Rick says, who's, who's actually in the outdoor, he's got this podcast called the outdoor biz podcast. And I can't remember where I connected with him, but we just chatted about more of the broader outdoor business, right? All the companies he's worked for, you know, backpacking and things. So yeah, it's this gigantic, you know, we're part of that, but really the fly fishing niche is our own unique thing. It seems like niching down in, in Denver makes, I don't know, I don't know, I guess it kind of makes more sense. You, you have more personal of, of a connection, right? I mean, what was it like walking into the big event when it was in, in uh, Orlando? Well, it was, it was a little overwhelming because the size of the ICAST show is ginormous compared to the size of the IFTD show. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So the IFTD show was in the back corner of the, of the ICAST show. You could walk for three days in the ICAST show and never see it all. Oh, wow. And you could, you know, walk a half a day in the fly fishing section of the IFTD show and see everything. So yep. the dealer support was a little weak uh, and on those shows. And when we went to Denver, that completely changed. So that was really good. So we, we, we've had IFTD shows before in uh, New Orleans and in Reno and other areas uh, as well. But just it's been challenging to, to get the, all the dealers and manufacturers to, to come to the show. And it just seems that when we have the show in Denver, yeah. everybody, everybody seems to want to come. There so that's, go. yeah, well, there's good, it's a good time of the year to uh, go trout fishing out there. So it brings in um, dealers from all around the country and manufacturers from all around the country. They, they all like to go trout fishing while they're out there and yeah. that's, it's for a, it makes for a good all around trip for sure. Yeah. I think it's easier too for, I mean, Denver seems like, I guess just from a Western side, you know, it definitely it just seems like it's easier to put that trip together for some reason. But, you know, I mean, I hope to get out more out East too. You know, obviously there's tons, there's so many, so many resources and events out there. That's big. Um, yeah. Let's jump in. If you want jump into tarpon here. I mean, I think tarpon is a species I've talked to people. You probably, I think, you know, Jim Teeny. he's a, he's an old family friend uh, of mine. And, uh, you know, I asked him way back and I think it was episode five when I first started this, I asked him what was his species, you know, if he had, if he could only pick one species and he was like tarpon, no question. And <laughs> you know what I mean? It was powerful because I've never fished for tarpon and, and it's definitely on my bucket list and I want to, and I know they're this ancient you know, dinosaur type fish, you know, this thing that's out there and all this amazing stuff. Can you, I mean, hopefully we have time to break into a little bit of the life history of tarpon and maybe a little conservation, but can you just start us off talking about your home water and, and how you catch tarpon out there? Sure. Well, so my home water is in the Florida Keys from, I I fish from Isla Mirada down to the Marquesas, which is about uh, almost a hundred mile span. Uh, moving east to west as the Keys uh, stick out 120 total miles out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the Marquesas are another 17 miles from Key West. So um, there's also down in the lower Florida Keys where I'm, um, where I live and fish most of the time, uh, there's about a 10 mile north and south um, section of the lower Keys that runs about 10 miles to the north and south and about 30 miles down uh, towards Key West. And in my opinion, um, that area and also some of the area up towards the Everglades, uh, which is only about 
19 miles away from the lower keys, uh, as the crow flies, um, offer potentially some of the best sight fishing in shallow water to giant tarpon in the world. Hmm. And we have, uh, all kinds of varieties of tarpon fishing. You can come in the earlier season, say like January, February, March, and have huge schools of pre, um, big laid up tarpon that move into pre-spawning staging areas in the back country. Uh, and they lay up, they're getting pushed down from the Gulf of Mexico right as we speak. So it's, it's mm-hmm. January right now. And these cold fronts come blowing through and the wind comes out of the north. Uh, the fish start to seem to move south and they show up down in the Keys this time of the year in big numbers. And depending on what the water temperatures are and what the weather's like, they'll be able to utilize the deep water access channels throughout the Keys um, and then they'll move right up on the flats when the conditions are right. And then uh, when the conditions are not so right, they move right off the flats and right back into the deep water uh, channel. So it allows them to have flexibility uh, and stay safe and comfortable in the nearby deep channels. So it can be really good if the conditions turn right, they just pop right out and the fishing's off the chart. But that can also lead to the fact that it might be a little challenging if the conditions aren't just right. They'll just move right off into the deeper channel and you'll never see them. <laughs> and they they might be unfishable if you're going to try to sight fish them. Mm-hmm. So with the endless miles of uh, flats that we have in the Keys, we have all kinds of different types of flats. we got big, beautiful, uh, white sand sweeping sandbars along the uh, backcountry and uh, oceanside flats in the Atlantic side. And then the Gulf side in the backcountry, we all, we all have these, uh, like I said, these big pre-spawning staging basins where they'll move in, where the average depth is six or eight feet. And that might go for a long ways along a certain shallow water bank or a cove. And they'll move in and they'll hang out and they'll lay up. And sometimes, depending on what the weather's doing, uh, will depend on how happy they are. And we can determine how happy they are by how high in the water column they will lay. <laughs> So a lot of times if it's windy and a little cooler, they'll be a little grumpy and they'll be in eight feet of water. They'll be down maybe four or five, six feet, or maybe even low and close to the bottom, kind of sulking like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> but then when the conditions get right, water warms up a little bit. Maybe it's a nice, steady, light breeze uh, out of the southeast, which is our predominant wind, which is very key. Um, those fish will rise higher in the water column. And the higher that they come up and they lay around, sometimes they'll lay with their back and their dorsal fins out of the water, which uh, at that point, they're usually, they show signs of being much more aggressive towards a fly, eating the fly when they're high in the water column mm-hmm. like that. So we yes. uh, we really look for those days for sure. So right now, the fish are pumping into the Keys. and But right now, I would say more than not, we have tough weather days, more tough weather days than... Um, positive weather days so uh that could be really good though because since there's not as many good days when the good days do come it's gangbusters but everybody and their grandmother comes floating up on the flat to get as much goodness as they can uh while the weather is right before the next front rolls through and then when the next front rolls through they're forced back down in the channels again so if you can come at this time of the year to experience some of the backcountry laid up tarpon fishing uh, a lot of the anglers absolutely love it and when a lot of guys say, when's the best time of the year to come tarpon fishing? I really don't know how to answer that question accurately because it depends on what you really want. Mm-hmm. So as far as do you want shot numbers of shots at fish or do you want actual bites, you know what I mean, or yeah. fish to the boat? Because in this early season, um, sometimes you can, you can have fishing where you might hook 12 or 15 giant tarpon in a day, which is great fishing. And all sight fishing and feed that many fish is really great, but you might only, you know, you might have 30 shots, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to feed half of them. Whereas in the Atlantic, on the Atlantic Ocean, on the ocean run, uh, which usually starts to happen mid-April to early May, uh, a lot of the fish in the backcountry, they'll move out to the deep water channels and the ocean side flats on the Atlantic Ocean side of the Florida Keys, and they will do what we call an annual tarpon migration, where they will school up in big schools and start to move up and down the outside edges of the Atlantic side of the Keys. And if that at that point, um, a lot of times the schools are very, very big, and you might see 200 fish in one school. 
And when you see multiple schools that size coming by, you might think that there's more tarpon here than anywhere else in the world, mm-hmm. but they're just more concentrated. And at that time of the year, they're a little more picky. I think they're they're more focused on on uh, playing Humpty Dumpty out on the reef and spawning uh, versus trying to get their feed bag on like they would be uh, when they travel down early in the spring and start laying up in the backcountry. Uh-huh. So they're more apt to eat, I think, in the, in the early spring in the backcountry on nice days um, than they are in, in May and June. But you might see more fish in May and June. And think that the fishing is unbelievable, but you probably won't catch as many, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, you'll see a lot more fish. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't have a great day at any given time of the year. Yeah. Um, From January till about mid-July in the Keys seems to be the highest numbers of giant tarpon in the Keys. Yep, yep. And what makes, uh, you you know, you mentioned giant tarpon. What what is the difference between a giant tarpon and a regular tarpon or even a, a juvenile tarpon? Well, that's a good question. Just just for hearsay, usually um, when we call a baby tarpon, usually it's probably under 25 or 30 pounds, right? So yeah. most people would be super Still happy be with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, listen, I'll be honest with you. A lot of guys that have a lot of tarpon experience uh, have caught a lot of bigger fish over 100 pounds and um, a lot of smaller fish under 100 pounds. They actually prefer to catch the ones that are under 40 pounds only because – um, they jump a bunch. Oh yeah. And not only when they jump a bunch, they exert a lot of energy when they do that. So they're actually, you're able to land the fish easily and you're not going to get beat up for right. an hour trying to do battle with, with a giant fish. Yeah. And, uh, when you hook a fish over a hundred pounds, depending on your experience level and your ability to fight the fish, you could easily, uh, have to fight the fish over an hour. And a lot of guys, if you're not in good athletic shape, Good luck with that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, you get really get whipped. And uh, so that's why they say, well, the baby ones, you still get uh, the excitement of watching the fish come up and eat the fly. They're a lot more uh, uh, available to eat the fly. They're, they're very aggressive. They're very opportunistic, the smaller fish. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to work so hard to get them to eat. You don't have to be just perfect. But that's what makes the big fish so awesome is that you do have to be perfect. You have to feed that fish. You have mm-hmm. to know exactly where your fly is in conjunction to where the fish is. You have to strip it just right, make sure there's no slack in the system, and make sure the fly is in the right spot. You got uh, to tease that fish into eating the fly. And if you're not able to have that visual connection on every strip to tell exactly what that tarpon is doing in between each strip, oh, what was that? Here he comes. Well, that well, that little twitch got him going. Here, let me twitch it again, twitch it again. And, and you're, you're feeding off the fish's movements yeah. and what what and how the fish reacts to every time you strip it and if you don't have that visual connection it uh you know feeding a big tarpon is hard yeah really really hard wow. it's so hard but it's even harder if you don't have that ability to sight fish truly sight fish the tarpon yeah that's so, what makes it tough and believe it or not you never believe how hard it is at times with the certain weather conditions if it's really calm and there's a lot of glare on the water and the light angles are different you can't see Giant six foot long tarpon, Jeez. thirty feet from the boat. It's really hard, and gin clear water. Wow! It, you know, there's definitely different angles of light that make a difference. And then when it starts wind blowing, and uh, you have chop on the water, that can both make it better, easier to see, and maybe not as much. But then you have to contend with the wind when you're trying to make a cast. So there's there's a lot to it, and that's why everybody loves it because when you do it right, and you get the fly in front of the fish, and you do it right, a lot of times they'll eat. They'll, they'll give you a reward, but uh, if you don't do it right, they won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> not, like, <laughs> not like permit fishing where you can make uh, a bunch of perfect presentations to the permit and they give you a finger every time. <laughs> this time, if you do it right with tarpon, they're going to probably play with you. you and, and that's cool. It's a really good reward, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, this is, it sounds like too that, you know, like you mentioned on the Atlantic side, it sounds like those fish, those bigger fish, they're, they're more challenging to catch out there. Is that, is that the case on the, especially the bigger of the giant? And is the giant, now how big are the giants again? What, what, what's the difference? Okay. Yeah. So baby fish, you know, usually 30 or 40 pounds down, down to, you know, to nothing. And then, then we start calling regular tarpon over 40 pounds, just tarpon. Yep. But then the big tarpon usually are, you know, 100, 120 pounds. And those are all the females, usually. Usually the females are over 100 pounds and okay. they're big. 
So those, right. those are the giant tarpon or the plus hundred pound plus. Yeah. And then we, we get fish, uh, up to 200 pounds over or over every year in the keys. Um, let me rephrase it. We're not landing no. fish over two pounds every year, but they're there. There's, I bet, I bet someone's catching 200 pound tarpon. Yeah, yeah for sure. Throughout some, the season. Yeah. So definitely some big fish for sure. Yeah. And, and are these tarpon, I mean, are, are people, are they all protected or people killing them? Are they, are they eating them? Is there any of that? What's the story there on all the tarpon, you know, whether fly fishing or not? They're not good to eat. They're, uh, they smell like uh, very sulfur, very mm. rotten, like a rot, pile of rotten eggs. So I can't wow. see be much appetite to eat them. Um, I know that they do apparently eat them over uh, in uh, Mexico, Belize, Honduras area, yeah. Guatemala. Uh, a lot of them times they'll catch them and literally throw them in their garden for uh, fertilizer, stuff oh, wow. like that. Wow. But, uh, but as far as I know, you're not allowed to kill uh, tarpon now legally. They're protected. Yeah. And uh, if you're going to try to catch one uh, for a world record, you have to buy a tarpon tag. Hmm. And you're only allowed one of those. So you got to be pretty picky on the one so, fish that you're going to attempt to try to get it. the record. And it sounds like this is a pretty, obviously everything you mentioned already sounds pretty challenging. I mean, are people going over there? Is there any opportunity out in that area of the Florida Keys or anywhere in your uh, your neighborhood where people can kind of, you know, do it themselves? Or do you pretty much have to have a boat and all the gear? What's the story there? Well, of course you could go out and do it yourself if you wanted to, if you had a boat and you had someone else that knew how to pull the boat. Yeah, and then you look for them, and you know what to do. She could certainly go out there and give it a wing and and figure it out. Um, it's uh, certainly challenging, but on the other hand, if you get into some baby tarpon, they're pretty easy to play with, right? You can stand on the side of a bridge, cast under the bridge when the tide's moving, and swing a fly under the bridge, and maybe get a a smaller tarpon or something like that. But when you hook, hook big fish, um, you got to chase them because they're going to smoke you. Yeah, and there's no way you can put enough pressure on the fish to land them without you know beating up the fish really bad or or, or giving the fish a uh, longer time to build up the lactose acid right. in it and and not be able to land it and then of course the shark longer you're fighting the fish it puts out uh um signs for sharks to follow and come in and then you have to deal with giant 15 foot bull sharks and hammerhead 21 foot t- hammerheads and tiger sharks and everything Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So you want to get a get a guide out for the when you're going for giant. All right. What would you you know as far as the conversation here? Would you you know enjoy more talking about the giant tarpon or catching some of the baby tarpon? If we were going to give it a little resource for somebody, a tarpon resource, the ultimate podcast resource for tarpon. What, what would you like to dig into? No, let's go big, man. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, let's yeah. go. Let's go big. Let's go. So basically, we're thinking about somebody's probably getting prepared to come out on a trip with you or somebody else that has all the stuff, and and we're talking giant tarp. And so, let's just start with you know from the beginning, uh, rod, reel, line. Um, you know, what does somebody need, and is that something that you provide? Well, of course, most of the tarpon guides do provide gear. Um, the only problem is you got to make sure they have the right retrieve reel yeah. for you. Um, what happens yeah. though, most most reels in the industry that you buy uh, are come out of the box left hand retrieve. And if you're a right hand caster, um, I've noticed over the years that um, a lot of anglers have a hard time reeling fast enough with their non dominant hand. So uh, what happens is uh, a tarpon, you might hook a 100 pound tarpon. And he'll torch you for 100 yards in about 10 seconds. Jeez. And then he'll turn around and come right back at you. And if you can't keep up with the slack that's building up the system, you're going to not be able to keep enough pressure on the fish and you might lose them. So you have to reel as quickly as you can. And to do that with your non-dominant hand and move your wrist in a very tight circumference that quickly is really challenging. Yeah. So what happens is a lot of times uh, I see the anglers that are right-handed casters and reeling lefty, their whole left arm moves around like a like a locomotive arm on a steam engine versus just the wrist um, spinning quickly as if you were a right-handed caster and reeling with your dominant hand, right hand. Uh, the wrist is just moving and it's snapping around quickly and you're able to regain uh, line quickly. Uh, so a right-hand retrieve, if you're right-handed caster, I would recommend. But if you can do it quickly with your non-dominant hand, great. There's no rules. You can do whatever you want. But, yeah, I've had a number of guys get on the boat and say, I'm, I'm switching over. 
and yeah. take all the reels back to the fly shop and have them all take all the their saltwater uh, reels, all the backing off, and put them back on, put yeah. them back back on the other way so they can uh, switch their reels over to a right hand retrieve, uh, being a right handed caster. So that's key. Uh, you might want to make sure if you're going to tartan fish, make sure you spend the extra money on a really good reel with a good drag system. It's really important. Um, a lot of the frames uh, and some of the reels that are low priced flex a lot. And a lot of times uh, when you find yourself in a big deep battle, you're, the angle and the pressure that you're putting on the fish is an immense and you end up torquing and twisting the frame a lot. And then that affects and they start scratching against the, the frame and the spool scratches against itself and creates mm. extra. Fit. If, if I was coming out, if I was going to be heading out on a trip with you, I mean, would you be providing everything sort of thing if I had, had a paid trip and I just could show up with just my, my, my you could. yeah. Yep, you could do that for sure. But one thing that will benefit you if you have your own gear is that you can practice before you come. Oh, right. And, and this, well, it's not going to stop, but <laughs> yeah. my point is so many guys come and they don't catch fish. Yeah. Oh, you- I mean, very, very, very common that anglers come for three, four, or five days and they don't land a tarpon on fly. And most of the time, the reason is, is that the fly never gets where it needs to go. It's because they can't cast. Yep. So what happens is you only truly get to cast, you know, a 10 or an 11 weight rod with the conditions on a bouncy boat with the wind changing <laughs> directions as the bows swinging to the right or left. And you have to adjust your cast. Uh, and any given cast could be totally different than the last one. And you have to do it really quickly because we have no time and space to work with. So your ability to be able to cast and effectively put the fly where you need to go and do it quickly with few false casts, high line speed, and get your line leader and fly to lay out straight, and you have to do it all within seven seconds, uh, it's really hard, and it takes time. So the more time that you're there on the bow of the boat trying to learn how to cast, yeah. you're, not, you're not able to learn the game of sight fishing. So even if you're from Montana, at least you can grab your 11 weight or 10 and go out in the grass and do a number of different things to help you become a, a proficient caster. Yeah. Well, when then when you get to the keys, which you don't have access to all, all the time, no. then you can focus on what you need to focus on when you get there. Like learning what the tarpon look like when they're, when they're uh, at this light angle and, or, or learning the difference between what a shark looks like and a tarpon, looking what the uh, different colors of the bottom does, look, looking how just all your situational awareness and everything that you need to be paying attention to both when you're casting and when you're not and when you're fishing and when you're hunting and looking, you don't have the ability to, to do all of that in Montana or Colorado or wherever you're from. So if, but what happens is a lot of guys miss opportunities to learn and gain that experience when they're there because they're too busy worrying about how to cast. Yeah. So the cast, the cast needs to be automatic. And if you can put the fly where you want to put it on any given wind angle and do it quickly, all within 50 feet, you really don't need to cast 100 feet. If you can do it within 50 feet, you're going to take advantage of a very large percentage of the amount of opportunities that you're going to get. Gotcha. So – yeah, it's 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 really 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 key. So practice, practice is uh, is very very important. Okay, so so fifty feet that that's good to know. And and you're trying to put that fly within what like a foot of the fish. Are you leading? Or where are you throwing it when you're out there? Say the person's on the front of your boat and they're making that cast. Where, where do you want to put that fly? Say that fish. Say you're in like you're talking about these fish are in shallow water. They're the giant giant tarpon. Where are you putting that fly in relation to the fish? <laughs> It depends, and it could change on every fish you see, depending on the angle of the sunlight, depending how fast the fish is moving, how deep is the fish, is there water flow, is he sitting in current, is he moving in current, and how deep is he, mm-hmm. is he moving? Are they expected, do you coach them before, or do you, are you teaching them right now, you like say, hey, you got to get to, you know, how do you do that, how does that look? The, the answer to that is yes. So I do everything I can prior to help them understand what we're looking for and what we could potentially see. So like, uh, all right, George, look out at 12 o'clock off the boat. See this bank, how it swings around to the left. Yeah. Normally I see fish swimming about 10 feet off this bank, but see, we have a really high tide right now. There's a lot of water up on top of the bank. So keep an eye out on the edge of the bank as well. 
we could see fish coming that way too. Since we have a lot of water over here to the right at two o'clock, they might cut over this bank coming around this island. See that? That's why. <laughs> there you explain, go. Explain everything what we could see. That's amazing. Right? Could, could we think of you know like one of your clients? Let's think of you know whoever you got somebody coming up here n- next week. Could we do a, a little? You know, a little something to help him where if he listened to this episode, it, it would help him prepare for your trip on that line. As far as like you're saying, like you're talking about these things close to the bank, shallow to the bank. Could you describe uh, the most uh, That's where it's challenging yeah. because we're not there? Yeah, you got to be there. You just got to be there. That is what I'm that. That's the key factor that we need to have full focus on the fishing aspect when we're there. But I'll be honest with you, a lot of the time, I I can't even go there to that level because right. we're still casting, learning, learning how to cast. Yeah. Oh. If you can get to a point where you're competent in, like I said, within 50 feet, uh, dropping your back cast, presenting on your back cast, or presenting on your forward cast yep. in any given direction, uh, you're going to be able to create valuable time and space to work with. So when your primary presentation lays out in front of the fish, you're going to do... What you have to do as an angler all the time, right away. No one's going to tell you to do this anymore. You have to come tight to that fly as quickly as you can once you present that line fly and leader in the water, okay? You have to get connected to that fly. Then once you're connected physically to the fly, hopefully you're still visually connected to the fish. Now you can start your secondary presentation, which is actually when you're going to present the fly to the fish. That's going to be changing with the light angle. We got to make sure the fish can see the fly at the farthest distance away from the fish that they can still see the fly. So let's just say that's 10 feet away because he's looking into the sun and can't see that far. So we want to show that fish, that fly 10 feet away. We do not want to show him the fly closer than we want to. We want him to see the fly as far away from the fish as, as he can see it. Cause what we want to do is create, an opportunity for the fish to believe it can act normal. And what I mean by that is the fish is is six feet long. They're nocturnal feeders. Okay. And the reason why is because for years they've tried to sneak up on a shrimp or a crab or bait fish during the day. Well, they just, they're not very sneaky. They're too big. So, the more effort that they put into trying to feed during the day, they don't get much out of it. So they have to use the element of darkness to hide their silhouette. And that's why they feed at night. And so during the day we have to, we have to (laughs) create an opportunity where the fish sees the bait or the fly from a distance. We have to make the fish believe that the fly has no idea that the tarpon is there. Yeah. And you're going to bring out a natural instinct in the fish to believe that, hey, whatever that thing is over there, it's moving really slow. Hmm. It's also green. What the heck? That's pretty cool looking. What is that? And you're going to spark its interest, right? And you're going to just keep moving it nice and slow and inviting. And you're not going to give it a fast twitch or anything like that. Because if you do, that's going to let the fish know. He knows. That. That he knows. Yep. And he's probably going to not even try. Huh. So he, you want to entice him from a distance and you're going to watch the fish. And a lot of times they might even go down a little bit in the water column to come up. Because what they do is they eat the fly above them. The way they're, the right. lower jaw of the tarpon closes, if you look at a photograph yeah. of it, it moves up and over the top. And, it, and the opening of the mouth is on the top of their head. Yep. So they're made to feed from underneath and feed if, on anything above them. So if that fly is below them or even at the same um, depth as them, it dramatically lowers the odds of you getting a take because it's it's not necessarily something that the tarpon usually does. They always come and feed underneath. So want to be able to make sure your fly is always presented above the fish. And allow the fish to comfortably come up underneath it and behind the fly. And then as you do that, you want to move the fly just right, like I talked a little bit earlier, and tease that fish into eating the fly. Mm-hmm. Anything anything too quick or, or too abrupt potentially could spook the tarpon and, and, and make him lose interest just because he knows 
oh, well, now the bait fish knows I'm here. Yep. My, my odds just went from 80% to catching this thing to, to 10%, and nice I'm not going to exert. I'm not going to exert all this energy to try to do it. So I'll screw it. Exactly. So a lot of times that happens. So, uh, it's all about getting the right setup and, and leading and crossing the tarpon. So you're going to lead the fish and then you're going to cross the fish with your fly. <laughs> what you're, what you're going to do with that time that you've created there is to give yourself time to put your rod tip down. Once your line lays out in the water, strip like crazy to come tight to the fly and move the fly so the fly is presenting to the fish five, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 feet out in front of the fish. So you're not trying to put the, the fly on top of the fish's head. No. Nothing, nothing falls out of the sky and lands right in front of them. It's just very unnatural. We want the fish to see the fly for the very first time from a distance, create that opportunity for the fish to believe it has a chance to ambush that bait and do what he naturally does. And that's come up from behind it, go down low, come up from behind it and take the fly like that. If anything happens too close to the fish, a lot of times they're not interested. Yep. So you have to create that intersect with the fish at the appropriate distance from the fish that they can see. And a lot of times that has to do with how deep the fish is moving. Um, and how uh, fast it's moving and what is the light angle they're looking into to see the fly. Yeah. Cause if they're looking into the sun, well, we can't see in the sun, so neither can they, they have a hard time. So you might have to start your uh, presentation uh, stripping a, a little later and let the fish get a little closer before you start to strip the fly. We're on a really clear day with really calm winds and um, really clear water. They can see the fly a mile away. Hmm. So you might be presenting to them at 15 feet away, wow. which means you, if they're moving, that means you might have to lead them 25 feet and throw another 20 feet past them and cross them that much to give yourself time to come tight to the fly, strip it and move it, get into position as to when then you're now presenting it to them 20, 25 feet away from them and they can see it from that far away. Huh. And, and it might, it might be only three or four strips from yeah. that distance depending if the fish is moving uh, as to when that fly is in a zone where he can see it from that distance. So you have to create time and space to work with. And if you use the fish as a target, you will not have any time and space to work with. And you'll be behind the fish. You'll be stripping the fly at the, at the fish and then he'll, he'll turn away. Or a lot of times what happens I've seen is it is hard to know exactly where your fly is, but you can, you can read the tarpon as you're stripping and see, even if it's a, uh, a movement of the fish that doesn't allow the fish to eat it, you can see what the fish is doing and why it's doing what it's doing. So a lot of times the fish will turn towards the angler as the angler strips the fly. And they think that the fish is following the fly. But in all reality, a fly is three feet on the other side of the tarpon. And when he's stripping at its head, the tarpon turns towards the angler He's going away from the fly. He doesn't want anything to do with the fly. So what happens is you want to watch that tarpon. If he turns towards you, but he's going down, that means his, the fly is coming at the fish and he's not going to eat it. Hmm. If the fly, if the fish turns towards you and he's coming up, that means he's coming onto the fly and he might eat it. So you, if, you, if you learn how to read the fish on, on every strip and every movement, what's going on, you can then make adjustments um, maybe major or micro adjustments that you need on, on a strip or a movement or whatever to try to get the fish to eat the fly before he gets close enough to the boat where he sees you. Yeah. Gotcha. So you're casting. Yeah. And that kind of paints a good picture. So when you cast that fly out, say it's in front of him 10 feet, that fly is sinking under the sur. Well, depending on the depth, but say that fish is a few feet under the surface, you're getting that fly kind of just below the surface. And I mean, how are you keeping it? What, what line are you using? What are your flies like that you're keeping that at the right of uh, the depth? Are you just waiting your flies or how do you do that? It has to do with how much you cross them. And what is the, explain the crossing. So if the fish is 25 feet from you and he's moving left, if you just make a 25 foot cast, the fly is going to land directly in front of the fish. Whenever the fly lands in front of the fish, they don't eat it. The fly needs to land 15 feet past, past the fish. Yep. So you're crossing them and leading them. So you're going to lead them 15 feet and you're going to cross them 15 feet. Cause that allows you to then 
so you got to figure that the tarpon has a cone of vision, right? Yeah. So the cone of vision is tighter towards where the, where the head of the tarpon is, and it gets wider as it goes away from the tarpon. So you want to keep the fly in that cone of vision at the correct distance all the time. If the fly is out of the cone of vision, he's not going to either see it or it's going to be too far uh, on one side of him or the other. So you have to create um, time and space. For you to move the fly and have it moving and looking natural when the fish gets, when the fly moves into that vision and the fish can see it. So if you if you throw too close to the fish, let's see, or you let's let's just say you lead them enough, right? You give them a big lead, but you don't cross them. Well, now you have to wait for the fish to get there, and as you wait, your fly is sinking. Yeah, and as your fly sinks, it's getting low, or maybe too low in the column pertaining to where the fish is and then you don't have much cross on them either so you you're you're showing him the fly right in front of him and it moving away we want him to see that thing coming across him but at a, at a far distance so you have to cross him and lead him and when you cross him you are then giving yourself the ability to have time to come tight to your fly and then start to move the fly at the right speed to keep the fly moving buoyant in the water column so everything comes together when the timing's right and you've crossed them enough to move that fly right in front of his path at the appropriate distance. If you don't cross them or you're short, you're, you're going to have to make another cast. Yeah, I got you. So you're timing this all. You're saying, say if the fish was 35 feet out moving to your left, you would make the cast say, depending, but you might make it 50 feet out and, and strip and, and get it all set up. So when that, that fly crosses yep. the fish, it's crossing, um, close and no, not too close, but close enough where it can, it can take it. Correct. So, and what, and typically how close, if you're doing that, if you're, you know, you le- you're crossing it, how, how close is that fly? You know, it's kind of above the fish, but how close is it? How high, how yeah, high how, is the sun? How yeah, high is the sun? How, clear, how much water flow is there? Cause I mean, if you make a 15 foot cast out in front of the tarpon and the, and the current's moving to the tarpon and the right. current's swimming, while he's going in the current, you ain't got no time. No. So you got to lead. You got to lead them thirty feet and cross them thirty feet. You know, get your slack out of the system. Strip the fly as quick yeah. as you can, and then you're just barely showing it to them at ten feet away. You want that inner. You want the the intersect of the tarpon to be at a distance from the fish. You don't want it right in front of the fish. You want the fish to see the fly from a distance, make his own judgment, and come up to eat the fly. Gotcha. Okay. Yep, we got to have them to see it from a distance in order to to mm-hmm. create a uh, uh, non-invasive natural presentation that will increase the odds of getting a take. <laughs> so there, there are a lot of elements that you have to, because if the boat, if if a fish is coming at a different angle uh, into the current, you have to adjust for that. So right when we get on the flat, I say, hey man, look look at the crab pot, see how the water flowed, the direction and how fast it's moving. Yep. And then I go, if the fish is sitting still, we're going to have to lead him X amount. If the fish is moving, we're going to have to move him X amount. And if the fish is moving and he's deep, we're going to have to move him, lead him even more. Hmm. So creating the time and space that you need to work with, as far as getting the slack out of your primary presentation, moving the fly in, in the right spot, it, it's a lot, but ideally here's the scoop. You should be hooked up within seven seconds. Hmm. And that seems like that's a short amount of time, but it's, it's fairly realistic. You're going to have three to four seconds. Your fly's already in the water. Now you're stripping and you're in your, here comes a fish and you're feeding them seven seconds. Whoa. So seven seconds within your fly hitting the water, you, you're hitting a fish. You want to no. hit a fish? No, seven seconds within your fly, leaving your hand from the ready position on the boat. Oh, wow. Yeah. So false cast right now. So, so we're, we need fast high line speed, um, fast tempo cast to help get our line leader and fly to lay out straight and aggressively, especially if it's windy. Huh. So we, we have to reduce the amount of false casts. We have to do side casts low to the ground. Yeah. So it helps increase our uh, accuracy and helps us get the fly in the water quicker. It makes us move faster because if we don't, the fly will take in the water. So uh, side casting is huge. High uh, high tempo casting is also very what is, key. What is so, high what is high tempo casting? Okay, so we can cast, we can walk around the block, we can jog around the block, we can run around the block, or we can sprint around the block. Which one's gonna be faster? Sprinting. Yep. So in all reality, we need to create as much time and space as we can to work with 
we need to sprint ideally, but I know that everybody can't sprint, but if you practice and you focus on, on working on your casting, you can increase the tempo of your cast. So you can move from casting really slow where your line is moving really slow in the air to where it's moving very fast in the air. (laughs) And when it's moving very fast in the air, you can control it easier, especially if you need longer and larger amounts of line out of the end of the rod tip. If it's moving faster in the air, you're going to have less effect from the wind. And when you go to cast in the wind, especially get the layout layout straight into the wind, you have to nut jam on that, man. You have to put a lot of power, a lot of line speed Mm -hmm. to get the line to lay out straight or else you're going to have a big pile of slack at the end. And if that's the case, then you're going to take yourself out of the game right away. Yep. So you have to have a slackless presentation or as close to it as possible. And the only way to get that is with high line speed casts. Plus, you want to reduce the amount of time that your line is in the air. So you can cast really slow and walk around the block if you want. Or you can sprint around the block and get it get your line in the water really quick. I think I'm going to choose... Yeah. Fast tempo cast. How, how many, sure. how many false casts is typically, say you were trying to get 50 feet out there. Is no more than, no more than three. Yep. If you can get to the point where you can, uh, get 50 feet within three, that's actually very easy. Um, well that that's very common and, and practical. Um, f- maybe four four false casts at the most to get to 70 feet, but it, most experienced anglers that can cast really well can get yeah. 70 feet three false three. Casts. and it seems like so you're saying you've got your your flies not in the water you're kind of holding it it's right there so you're, you're pretty much you see a fish you pick it up do a false cast you go forward you do another false cast you go forward you do another false cast and then you make your cast correct that's but you uh, have to, yeah here's this is why you need to learn how to cast you need to learn how to form tight loops because if you don't know how to form a tight loop at will you will not be able to shoot much line on your false cast, both on your forward and your back cast. And that is the key. You have to be able to shoot a lot of line quickly to get that weight or the amount of line out of the end of the rod tip to make the cast you need to make. Yep. If you can't get, if you, you can make four false casts or two false casts or whatever, but if you're not shooting much line on the end of the rod tip and getting much line out, it's not helping you to load the rod enough to make the cast you need to make. So on top of the fact, that you're only going to make three false casts. You need to shoot a lot of line in between each false cast to get amount of weight or yeah. amount of line out of the rod tip to load the rod enough to make the cast you need to make. <laughs> That's it. And yeah, well, I mean, and if, if you do it slowly, yeah. <laughs> you, you won't be able you're to do it. shoot much line. If you have a wide loop, you're not going to shoot much line. So what, <clears throat> so when you have a nice tight loop, it's carrying all the energy within the upper and the lower leg of that loop. Once that loop unrolls straight and the upper leg is, is, is laid out straight, there's no, no way to contain the energy anymore and your cast is over. So your line doesn't just lay out straight in the air and then keep going. You have to continue to form a loop and feed that loop more line in order for it to continue to form. Therefore, it will continue to travel. That's yeah. why wide lo- that's why wide loops don't go anywhere. The second you have a wide loop, it opens up immediately. All the energy is gone. It doesn't go anywhere. It, tight it, loops continue to travel. Tight loops are, are what you need. And and is there? I mean, is there a video resource, anything on casting? I, obviously, you got to you know do it, but that somebody could watch to see what you're talking about as far as these tight loops and and what the difference between a, a tight loop and an open loop is. Um. Or what do you what do you tell somebody? I mean, if you're I know I've had a few guests on um, that have a whole deal where, you know, they, for steelhead fishing, people come out before the trip and practice the spay cast, for example, before they get out there. But uh, you said practicing, but what you're talking about is, you know, this is this is a lot of challenge. It seems like you couldn't really mimic all these things on the grass. I mean, what do you tell your clients before other than just practice casting? Well, mimicking the things that you don't have control in the grass, it w- are things that you can only learn on the flats, right? You don't know what the tarpon, you know, basically yeah. you have to, you have to have your cast lay out straight no matter what's happening, right? So if you can get to the point where you have control of your system, which most people don't, it's okay, but they just don't. You, you need to have control over the system. You got to be able to put the fly where you want to put it. Mm-hmm. 
And in order to do that, you have to have loop control. And if you don't have the ability to be able to form the size loops along with the different trajectories that you need, high back cast, low forward cast, or side, complete side casting, or, or off shoulder cast, or whatever, if, you, if you're not able to actually form the loops with the trajectories that you need, it'll be difficult for you to fight the wind and to get your line leader and fly layout straight, which is really important in the salt. Yeah. Okay. The one thing too with with professional sports too is a lot of times, I you know, I'm 47 now. I can go play a pickup game of basketball at the local gym. It's fun. Everybody's having a great time, and maybe we shoot lights out one night. It's great, but everything's slow paced. Yeah. When you go to the pros, oh, man. everything is. I mean, when you make it to the major league baseball, uh, pitches yeah. are in the high nineties, or even They're not college, in the or even college. Yeah. I mean, when it gets real, it's it's a time issue. Everything is faster. Yeah. And this this is the profession. This is the this, this is, is, is the hardest. You're a pro. You're yeah. You're like you're like LeBron out there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I just I just watched LeBron last night. He was playing. Uh, oh, who they played? Somebody and. I mean, God, the guy's leading the league, I think, 25 points per game, 10 assists, something like that. I mean, well, he's old for, for a, you know, he's probably only 30 or whatever he is. But, I mean, LeBron's the exact extreme because, dude, the guy is this humongous muscle of craziness, and he's quick. You know, he's like a little point guard. I mean, it's unbelievable, the, the level, when you think about it. And fly fishing, again, the stuff you're talking about, I, I love that analogy because I think it resonates. It, as I listen to you talk, it just sounds like, I mean, this is a challenge. This is a challenge. To, but you said people do come out there that are that are new to it and do hit 12 fish. Is that? No, I never said new no, guys okay. hit 12 fish. Okay, so not new guys. So, yeah. In this thing. But you could, right? There's, I mean, who knows, right? I've had guys hit themselves in the back of the head with the fly <laughs> the first time they cast. They, they couldn't cast their way out of a shoebox. And the wind blew the fly out in front of them. And he um, go. hooked a giant fish. And next thing you know, the line's wrapped around his left oh. foot. Ripping, ripping his Rolex off his watch and wrapped around his neck all at the same time. Damn. And the next thing you know, I tell the guy to lay down on the deck and he's laying down while he's trying to clear the line on the reel. He doesn't even know how to, boom, he gets the line uh, oh. on the reel some miraculous way and we land the fish. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what, what, what not to do. To what, yeah. What about? You're going to get out of it. You're yeah. going to get out of it what you put into it. And yeah. if you don't know how to cast, you will not have very much luck catching fish yeah, yeah. and you will be frustrated and dealing with the wind and all that jazz. So, um, you know, practice makes perfect, right? Yeah. Well, I think, I think practice makes permanent. The more you practice, you build your muscle memory up. So it's automatic and that's what needs to happen. When you see the fish, your cast needs to be automatic. You can't stop and think, if your rod tip's moving in a straight line plane, if you're having a smooth acceleration of power throughout the entire casting stroke, whether you're stopping abruptly in between each casting stroke to help form that loop, or whether your stroke length or your pause time is equal to the amount of line you have out of the end of the rod tip, all that technical stuff, you got to learn that before you come. Yeah, that's the bottom line. You can't focusing on any of that stuff while you're trying to do the biggest, badass, big game fly fishing in the world. Yeah. To, that's it's it. just not gonna, it's it's the pinnacle yeah you hear about the giant trevally and like you said permit and all these amazing fish i mean bonefish or and, and bonefish but tarpon are do you think they are are the hardest these giant tarpon the hardest fish to catch on the fly no permit are oh permit oh, right permit are yeah because they're the non they'll they'll not bite but 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 as far as everything it needs to to get in they're, they're up there they're they're one of those yep. yeah and, and you described it what do you think i mean as far as the the rod reel line could you just break that out really quick what is if somebody if i was going to go buy you know what, what would you recommend uh, for for and you could talk about companies that you want or whatever uh 10 or 11 weight uh, Loomis NRX rods are great. They just came out with the new NRX pros. They're sick. Highly recommend you go to a local fly fishing show right now, this time of the year, they're, they're, uh, all over in Loomis is at all those shows. So you can go out and actually cast the rods oh, yourself. Right. Yep. I highly recommend for you go spend money that you actually cast a rod and, and try it with different lines and different leader setups. Cause, uh, that can make a big difference as to how much you might like a rod. Mm hmm. Well, um, I would also recommend the uh, Airflow Tropical Punch Bruce Chardline. Those are great. Oh yeah, yeah, saying own, that, that's right. Uh, 
extremely popular uh, saltwater fly line for a reason, and uh, you're going to really enjoy that taper for sure, especially if you're getting started. Um, but also, um, there's a lot of good reels out there, but I like the hatch reels. I'd get like a, a 9 plus and or an 11 plus for your 10 or 11 weight rod. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, uh, we used to have to throw 12s a lot, but now now everybody's moving towards like their big heavy tarpon rod is an 11 weight and their lightweight tarpon rods at 10 weight. And okay. with learning how to effectively apply pressure on a fish when you're fighting a fish, you're going to learn with experience that uh, having a heavier, beefier rod could potentially have uh, an advantage uh, if fish go straight down under the boat for some lifting power. Right. But most of the time, if you're fighting fish in shallower water, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter that much uh, how f- much lifting power you have in the rod. Because if you think about it, if you, you're you uh, swinging a, a fly and you get it stuck on the bottom in the rocks in the river, okay? Mm-hmm. And you're wiggling your rod tip and you're doing the roll cast. Yep. You're doing whatever you can to try to create a different angle that maybe the fly will come out and you just can't and you're going all right i guess i'm gonna break it off yep how do you do it no <laughs> rod movement at all you point the rod directly down the line right yep pinch it to the rod cork turn around so the line doesn't smack <laughs> it, and you pull as hard as you can straight direct in line pressure no rod movement because if you move the rod you can't break it off so if you think about it, when you're fighting big fish you need to put mega pressure why are you bending the rod so no bend well a little a little, a little bit bend. you want to create an angle on the pressure yeah then you need a little bit of a bend right so if the fish is moving to the right you want to angle down to the left right down his back and as the fish continues to move right he's going to feel that resistance and he's going to go i don't like that and he's going to try to go the other direction he's right. going to move his, and when he moves to his left as he's moving to the left, you're swinging over to the right, and you're keeping direct pressure down his back all the time. What you're really trying to do is restrict his ability to move forward, getting fresh oxygenated water into his gills. So basically, in a kind way, you're you're yep. suffocating him. You're you're not allowing him to get the oxygen that he needs, and then he's going to give up quicker. And then once he gives up quicker. Uh, you're going to get him to the boat. You're going to take the fly out, and then you're going to be able to let him go, and he's going to feel um, more refreshed, believe it or not, because he's not going to have as much acid build up, and he'll be able to regroup really quick and take off, which is great. Yeah. So it's good for everybody. But, huh. man, it's it's hard. Um, well, something that once you get your casting down, you can focus on, too, is tie yourself up a tarpon leader and put a tarpon fly in the end of it. And stick it in a tree or wrap it, wrap the hook um, and the leader around a tree branch or something and put as much pressure on that leader system as you can and try to break it <laughs> and, get, and get to the point where you know how much pressure you can put on that leader and on that hook before something gives. And that is how much you want to pressure you want to put on those fish almost to that point right you want to keep mass mega pressure on those fish all the time and that's why you need a that's why you need a reel with a really good drag system because if you don't have that you're not gonna be able to put that much pressure on them no no so this is uh yeah (laughs) bruce this is i think we're we're over an hour into this one um we were talking to kind of at the start about the timing um you know, we're probably not going to be able to dig into some of the topics and maybe I can get you on down the line again to, to talk about some of the, if we want to dig into conservation, things like that. But, um, I did have a little, you know, to kind of slowly or kind of quickly wrap this up. Um, I usually start off with a little rapid fire round. Do you want to jump into that real quick? Sure. Yeah, cool. And I just, before we get there, you, um, on the, the setting, the hook, can you just describe that a little bit for us? So, so when you do everything right and that fish does take, what is that? Is that just a typical, uh, what you would set with any saltwater fish or how does that look? Well, technically we just went over the fact of what you need to do to actually have to break your fly off. If it's caught on the bottom, you need yep. direct connect to have the most pressure, right? Well, tarpon have, uh, 80% of their mouth is all bone. Nice. So when you eat the fly, if you swing your rod or raise your rod like you would trout fishing, you're either going to pull the fly out of the top of their lips because we talked about how the angle yep. of their lip 
is on top of their head. So if you raise your rod like a trout, you're going to pull it right out of his mouth. Or if you do end up coming tight, you're going to have very little pressure on the system to set the hook into a rocky, bony bucket mouth. You need direct connect pressure. But the tarpon eat the fly two different ways. They'll come at you when they eat the fly, creating slack in the system. You might, if you don't see him eat it, and he did eat it, you're going to not feel anything on that next strip. It's going to feel slack. So you have to stop your foot on the deck, scare them, <laughs> so they'll turn their head to the right or left, and then you can do a direct strip right into their jaw and hopefully get a good hook set. Wow. Or if the fish eats the fly uh, another way, they'll come up and they'll eat it and they'll turn right away. And that's great because when they turn right away, then you can hold tight and jam them. But if you strip hard, against that fish when he eats and turns and he's going away something's going to give oh yeah okay <laughs> so it's not, be ready, gotcha be ready to give line back to the fish right away because you can't hold tight and jam a direct connect against a giant fish that's pulling away from you something's going to break so just you have to be mindful of that and be able to yeah. uh ease off on on the hook set there uh, yeah. right away with a, a micro adjustment and uh stay connected as best you can okay so it's like, like kind of like the casting you said, or the strip. It's it, yeah. It just depends on the situation, uh, and and you mentioned the line. So we kind of cover all that stuff. Let's just jump into the flies real quick. I kind of usually start off the the rapid fire with just the two twenty two, which is your top two flies tips and top two resources. And can you just talk about a couple of flies that you you know just simple what you would recommend, or maybe your top two flies that you do well with out there? Sure. Well, there's there's a popular tarpon fly called the toad. And the reason why it's popular is because the way it's tied with the with the antron yarn on the front and the marabou on the back or a bunny tail is that you can strip it really slow. It's a non-invasive strip. And with the yarn on the front, it allows it to stay buoyant in the oh, water column. Man. Makes it look natural. So if you strip too fast, the, ri- the fly will ride up at an angle. Fish won't eat it. If you strip too slow, the fly will actually sink as you're stripping it. They won't eat it. Mm-hmm. So it's got to stay buoyant. How do you strip it nice and slow and not too quick, but keep it buoyant and still have movement? Well, you need marabou or bunny, right? It really undulates yep. big time with little movement in the water. So it gives the fly a lot of life and a lot of movement without moving it much, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. So that fly is great oh, when you tie foam on the front as well and keep it up high in the water column. And you can use a variety of different colors. Black and purples work really well. Um, Yep. Reds, yellows, greens, chartreuses, oranges, they all work really good. So if you, if you had every, every guy to ask, you know, what's your favorite tarpon fly, you'd have every color in the rainbow on the table, I'd tell you. Oh, okay. So you know, they eat all kinds of stuff. It's all about the presentation more than not. What, what do you, is there a certain species of fish that you're imitating or is it just a bunch of whatever? No, I think it's kind of an attractive thing. I think, oh, a lot of okay. fish, I think fish are kind of like, Hey, what's that? Yeah. Cause I don't know if I've ever thrown anything that looks identical to whatever they're eating. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, yeah so some shrimp, maybe some shrimp or pull all the worm patterns are pretty close. Yeah. So you, you kind of imitate that. But a lot of times, a lot of the just dark, dark or light colored streamer patterns we use, I don't really imitate anything that yeah. I know of. Yep. Gotcha. And, and you meant in the toad, is that just a T O A D or was that the name of the fly? Mm-hmm. Is there a second fly that you would you would recommend or something somebody can look at online, search it up? Any little shrimp patterns work great. Um, uh, any variety of tarpon flies work great. Palola worm flies are really popular okay. as well. All right, perfect, mm-hmm. perfect. And you you threw out a, a ton of tips in here. I mean, we've we've talked about a bunch of things. Is there a any other couple of tips you would recommend for somebody if it was their first time heading out for tarpon with you on, on the boat? We could be on here for the next four hours. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, but just the the casting thing is key. Uh, the the hook setting is going to be hard to practice without actually having fish eat because it's a it's a read and react skill. Yeah. And you have to read and react to whatever happens and make that move. So you're definitely going to make some mistakes right away on that. Um, but um. I think one thing that really helps everybody too is if they can learn how to fly uh, tie flies, it it really helps the anglers to understand uh, what our objectives are when we're when we're f- trying to f- strip the fly to a fish. Uh, a lot of anglers don't tie, which is fine, uh, 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. You don't have to. But I think it just brings another level of of uh, <clears throat> compliance to the game with the angler. When, when they're able to understand what, what deer hair on the front of the hook does versus you know a bunny strip or something like that, it really makes a big difference on how they're going to fish the fly when they strip it and feel that fly move. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just makes a big difference. So if, if you uh, can learn about the um, tying materials and why they're tied on the hooks and, and what kind of hooks that we use as far as um, being heavy or light wire hooks and why for certain patterns. And it really makes a big difference on that. And, and plus knots, are, knots are huge too. So being able to rig your own stuff also is very helpful to being a complete tarpon angler. Okay. What is it just quickly, the leader setup? up, what does that look like? Is it just a straight, uh, you know, diameter leader? Or are you building uh, different uh, diameters in, in the leader? Well, it depends on who you talk to. There's many different ways to skin a cat. But what I like to do is uh, I like to create my leaders myself. I I make them all myself. And I design them in a way that allows the front – allows the leader to act like a front taper of your fly line. So the longer and the skinnier your front taper is on your fly line, the more uh, energy is dispersed before it gets to the leader. So you need to have – thick mass in your leader or in your fly line to contain energy. So the smaller the diameter, the less energy it can hold. So I like to have my leaders act as if it's a continuation of the front taper all the way to the fly. So I taper it down every two feet in equal diameter uh, increments. You can check it out on the hatch website. I have all of uh, my bonefish permit and tarpon uh, leader recipes, uh, and videos right there. You oh, can perfect. check them out there. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Awesome. That's great. That, that just leads into the next question on the top two resources. So there's one good resource on, on hatch. Is that where I know you've written a lot. I mean, you've got magazine articles and things. What is you, what do you think is something that you've, you know, you would direct somebody to of, for your own stuff to learn about more about tarp and to take this conversation further? Well, that's a good question because I'm in the middle of of creating uh, a website that will help everybody learn all this stuff. Oh, nice. And I really don't know. You just Google my name. You'll be able to find some stuff, but also just, just Google these topics and you'll, you'll have yeah. a lot of different, uh, uh, different areas where you can get different feedback. And that's going to be good too. Cause you might, you're going to pick up a little bit from me and pick up a little bit from Dave and you pick up a little bit from George. And then that's going to make you the angler you are, and you're going to pick what works for you and what you like and stick with that. And it's all good. And until, until you're forced to find out something that, that you need to change, you know, you're, you're in a good way. There's, like I said, there's more ways to skin a cat than, than one. So if someone says you have to use this, not, well, maybe you don't have to, but if you like it and it works for you, then great. Yeah. I and mean, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that says you have to do this or you have to do that. Sure. Um, you have to do it my way or it's not going <laughs> to work. Cause then that's not the case, but yeah. What, what is the knot you use to tie the leader? And what, what does your tippet look like? The size of the tip, and then what is the knot you use to tie your fly on? Well, just so we all know, true tippet in the leader is the weakest link that you have in your leader. So when we tarpon fish, we put a bite or a shock tippet oh, on right. the end. Okay. So, so that's going to be a different uh, um, than your actual tippet size. So uh, a lot of traditional tarpon leaders have a butt section. Um a thicker butt section that equals the diameter of the front taper that they're connected to. Uh-huh. But I don't want to get into saying 50, 60, 40 sure. or 80 pound because it depends on uh, what line you have. And it depends on what manufacturer is making the monofilament because one guy's one manufacturer's 60 pound is completely different than another in sure. as far as diameter and stiffness and everything. So, um, <clears throat> But you'll have a butt section, maybe sometimes just one six or eight foot butt section, or sometimes two or three butt sections uh, that uh, uh, sections that make up the butt section that last eight, uh, you know, six to eight feet long. And then you'll put on your class tippet, which is usually sixteen or twenty pound test, and then you'll put on a shock tippet on the end of that of anywhere from forty, fifty, sixty, or eighty pound test, depending on what you want to do and what your objectives are. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. All right, Bruce. Well, we didn't cover everything here. Um, we're going to have to leave it till the next one. I, you know, I wanted to touch on more on fly tying, but I think, um, yeah, we can, we can swing back. I did have a couple, just one little random one for you here. Um, 
your well, I guess this isn't totally random, but your boat. What, what, what's the what's the go to boat that you recommend or you, you use? Uh, boat. Yeah. Well, what, the boat. I yeah. Dolphins. It's a sixteen foot dolphin super skiff. Okay. Uh, super quiet, super stealthy, uh, easy to pull. Um, but there's uh, there's other great boats out there too. There's a uh, the Chittam makes a great boat right now. It's super light, uh, carbon hull, um, run you about eight or ninety thousand. But there you go. You know, get to, <laughs> Not a get to <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, nice. And, uh, Maverick, Maverick makes great, great skiff as well. Okay, yeah, clean 100k. That, that sounds like a like a good deal. Um, and then, so <laughs> what about on, on uh, if you were we talked about sports a little bit? If you were going to go pro in anything throughout your life, what what would that sport be other than fly fishing? What would the actual sport be? Did, did you did you have anything you played or anything throughout your life? I did play a lot of baseball, but I'm not sure how far I would have made it. <laughs> gotcha. So baseball that that'd be the one. Is that the one you would? Uh, which one would you have loved to to go pro in most? Probably baseball. Yeah, baseball. And what was your position? I played in field, second, short, third base. Yep. And uh, I, I, I was, uh, well, compared to my hitting ability, I, uh, I could field pretty good. So I enjoyed fielding. There you go. You Had stay, a good you arm. stay down, so you get a, a one of those kind of a hopper drill. To you, you'd stay down on it. You wouldn't let it go between your legs. <laughs> Hey, keep it in front of all times, right? Oh god, that was the worst, man. I, that's why I hated infield because you know it'd be coming. You just do one of those would pop you in the face or it'd hit you really hard. You just had to stay down. I, I was more of an outfielder, so that's I think that's the reason why. What about what about your car? I think this is kind of a random. What your dream? Did you have when you were a kid that kind of a dream car or something, or, or maybe you have one now, something that you always wanted to have? I do have what I've always wanted to have right now. It's a Toyota Forerunner, and I love it. Oh, there you yeah, go. It's super practical and. Uh, comfortable and, yep. and great uh, and dependable. So I, I love that. But no, I never was a car guy. My son, who guides as well with me, he's 21. He's been guiding with me for three years now. Um, he's a big uh, he's a big car guy. He loves all the fast cars, all the Lamborghinis and oh, really? Pag- Paganis and Bugattis and all that jazz. He all that tell stuff. You. Yeah, <laughs> you could talk to him. Okay, well, if we we get a car, it's funny because the cars you see, all, you know, around here, a lot of the Mustangs and Chevy. I mean, they have all these muscle cars, right? That are, I've heard it's kind of crazy, right? They have so many horsepower that normal people probably shouldn't even be driving, and they're so, you know, they're so dangerous. But yeah, we'll have to leave that for another episode. Um, but yeah, Bruce, I just wanted to uh, just check in with you in the next six to twelve months or so. Anything new with you or you know your your business you want to let us know coming out? No, no, just. Uh... Check out brucechard.com. You'll get all the information you need and let me know if you have any questions. Okay. And it was at brucechard.com or brucechardflyfishing.com? Well, brucechardflyfishing at gmail.com is my email. And if you want my website, it's just brucechard.com. Oh, that's right. Just brucechard.com. Okay. All right, Bruce. Well, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for, you know, sharing all the tips. You definitely, I, it was awesome. I was just sitting here listening to you kind of go off and talk about it all you're obviously a wealth of knowledge and i'm i hope that some people will connect with you and maybe get their first tarp and i i'm hopefully going to get my first one here the next year so we'll, i'll let you know if i do but uh, yeah thanks for for sharing your, your knowledge sounds great dave thanks for having me buddy. okay all right see you man bye bye so there you go if you want to find all the notes with all links we cover just go to wetflyswing.com slash one two four If you need a new spay rod and want to support this podcast and one of our local fly shops, head over to wetflyswing.com slash echo, that's E-C-H-O, and take a peek at the echo full spay that I use for winter steelhead. If you make a purchase through that link today, you get a free line and uh, the podcast gets a small commission at no extra charge to you. I want to uh, thank you for your support and uh, let you know you can send me an email at dave at wetflyswing.com or call me at 971-220-1093 if you have any feedback for the podcast or for me. I want to thank you again for stopping by to take a listen to the show and for hanging around uh, till the end here. I'm uh, hopefully going to catch up with you on the river sometime. So uh, hope to hope to see you then. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.